The identity of a disciple is expressed in attitudes and practices that are formed as that disciple follows Jesus Christ. As you think about those attitudes and those practices, what are, what are the essential ones? I mean, what are the ones, when you boil them all down, are the most fundamental and most essential for a disciple? Well, Paul points out some of those in 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, starting in verse 16, it's just three short verses. Two of them only have two words in them each. And then, and then verse 18, as he rounds out his thought. But in verse 13, 16, he says, Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The Thessalonians were no strangers to joy. They had learned the joy that comes from following Jesus Christ. They had learned the joy that comes through being washed by his blood, being, being brought into a saved relationship with him. But as you go through trials and you go through difficulties, sometimes you can lose sight of that joy. And that may be what the Thessalonians were experiencing as they had questions about the, the reason why they were having difficulties. And and concerned about loved ones of theirs that had <clears throat> died before Jesus had come again. Paul addresses some of those things. And so Paul reminds them, rejoice. But, but not just rejoice every once in a while, rejoice always. There's a companion passage in Philippians 4 where Paul will say the same thing. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Christians sometimes have to be reminded to rejoice. Because this world, with its difficulties, sometimes distracts us from that joy that is ours. Then he follows that up with pray continually. Because really, joy can only be experienced when we stay in that constant communion and that constant communication with God. He says pray continually. And the word that he uses for prayer here is the most comprehensive of words for prayer. I mean, it... it it includes all forms of prayer. It includes all settings for prayer. It is that, that communication that we have with our Lord. And then he follows that with the attitude that we should have as we go in prayer. Give thanks. In all circumstances, he says. This joy and this thanksgiving that we have are not based on circumstances. They're not dependent on circumstances. He says, give thanks in all circumstances. Again, these, these thoughts are expressed in Philippians 4. As Paul talks about rejoicing, he talks about not being anxious, but taking everything that we have to God in prayer, making those requests known, giving thanks in all circumstances. Paul seems to say these are some of the essentials that, that we have when it comes to our attitudes and our practices in Jesus Christ. And notice how he follows it up. He says, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. This is what God wants for you. So today, as, as we talk about what it means to be a disciple, and as we look at what it is that forms our identity, what we know of ourselves as disciples, we're going to look at the second, the middle of these three essentials that Paul talks about. Pray continually. Because what we're going to find as we look at Scripture and we look at this life as a disciple is that disciples are those who are prayer practitioners. We've, we've talked about various things that it means to be a disciple, those identifying marks. And today we want to talk about that identifying mark of prayer. And to do that, we're going to go over to Luke chapter 18. We're going to look at a couple of stories that Jesus told, a couple of parables. And both of them are centered on prayer. They, the prayer is an important element in each one of them. And notice what it is that Jesus wants us to understand as we follow him, as we become his disciples, how we live in discipleship with him. So let's go to Luke chapter 18. And we're going to start at the beginning of the chapter where he tells a story about a vulnerable widow who petitions a godless judge. We've heard this parable before. Listen as Jesus tells it. Verse, 18, uh, uh, verse 1 of chapter 18, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. 
Now I want to stop right there for just a minute as Luke introduces the story of Jesus. In the Gospels, most of the time whenever Jesus tells a parable, tells a story like this, he oftentimes don't, doesn't give the uh, the punchline. He doesn't give the lesson to it. Instead, he, he lays it out there, and then sometimes he'll say, he who has an ear, let him hear. We've, we've mentioned that before. Uh, but oftentimes, he'll just lay it there because he wants people to wrestle with the parables. He wants people to, to ruminate on them. He wants them to reflect on them. He, he wants them to think through the aspects of the parable to bring out the lessons that Jesus is trying to give through those stories. Um, and then there are other times that Jesus will tell a parable to the crowds, and then he'll go behind closed doors and he'll talk to the twelve, and he will explain the parable to them. He'll give them the meaning of the parable. Here is an unusual instance where Luke will tell us the meaning of the parable before Jesus tells it. He says, Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. Now listen to the parable. He said, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The judge in this particular story is probably not a Jewish judge. This is going to be in the civil court system of, of the Romans at the time, and it's not a Jewish judge because the Jewish court system was quite different. They didn't really have judges that decided cases. They had elders. And whenever they would meet to decide something, they would typically have three elders that would decide a case. They would have an elder that was chosen by the plaintiff of the case. They would have an elder that was chosen by the defense, uh, the defendant. And um, then they would have a third elder that would join the group who was chosen um, by an outside party. And then these three would decide the case against the plaintiff and the defendant. Here we've got the one judge, probably one that was uh, appointed by Herod uh, as governor of the region, or maybe one that was appointed by the Roman uh, officials. So here a is a judge. He's a pagan judge. He, he doesn't fear God. He doesn't care what God thinks. He doesn't even care what people think. Instead, he makes decisions based on another uh, criteria. And what would that be? These judges were known for being notoriously unfair. They gave their judgment to the one who could bribe them the most, the one who could pay them the most money. And so when these, these civil cases came to them, these, these disputes over property or over money, well, whoever had the greatest resources would be the one who would get the judgment in their favor. So you got the judge, but then you've got this widow. This widow is symbolic of all who are poor, all who are vulnerable, those that don't have any resources of any kind to sway a decision in their favor. And that's what we've got here, a widow who has nothing who can convince a judge to follow her way, to extract justice from a judge to go her way. She doesn't have anything except maybe one thing, and that's her persistence. That's the only resource that this widow had. Now notice, as Jesus tells the story, the widow seems to have a just uh, complaint against whoever it is, her adversary, whoever it is that she has something against, whoever's taking advantage of her. The question is not, does she have the right case? No, she she is deserves whatever... Uh, justice that she is asking for. But yet she has no way of getting the judge to grant her plea. Instead, Jesus says the widow in that town 
kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice in my adversary, against my adversary. The, the wording here, if you go back to the original, um, has the idea of she kept coming and kept coming and kept coming and kept coming and kept coming. She was one who would just nag this judge, who would continue to bring this against uh, to, to the judge, trying to get her plea heard. I mean, you know people in your life that tend to do that, don't you? It, it could be uh, your kids, could be your grandkids. Maybe you were the one who was like this. I, I remember whenever Angela and I first got married, it was during a time whenever home computers were really uh, becoming a thing. Uh, they were still early on in their development, but they were uh, they were a thing. And so I was really wanting a home computer. And so I would bring it up and I would bring it up again and I would bring it up again. Why would I do that? Well, I don't know. I, maybe I was hoping I'd wear her down. Maybe we could finally get this home computer. And, and I remember Angela telling me, would you just stop? Would you just stop bringing this up? We can't do this right now. You know that. And when we don't, you make me out to be the bad guy. I, it, it, she's right. I mean, I was not fair in this. But eventually, we were able to get that home computer. And what's been funny to me, just as a side note, is that she's been the one that has used it much more than me whenever it's the, it's the computer at the house. And so I have to remind her of that. Aren't you glad I finally nagged you enough to get this computer? Well, you've got this woman that that's what she does. She brings her plea to the judge over and over and over again. And so you got to ask, well, why did the judge finally grant her plea? Why did the judge finally give her what she wanted, finally give her the justice that she was looking for? Well, there was only really one reason. She wore him down. Now, the New International Version really doesn't word this probably the best way that it should. Notice in, in verse um, 4, after he refused for so long, he finally said, even though I don't fear God and I don't care what people think, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. Now, when I first read that, I wondered, how would this widow, poor and vulnerable as she is, what threat could she possibly be to this judge? I mean, did she have some extended family that she could bring along with her to, to somehow intimidate this judge? No, I, I kind of doubt that. The, the better translation of this passage probably reads something like this. Yet because this widow keeps on bothering me, I will give her justice, or in the end, she will wear me out by her unending pleas. There's something in the original language that could suggest violence, could suggest threats of some kind, but the message um, reads it this way that probably puts those two thoughts together in a good way. The message says, but because this widow won't quit badgering me, I better do something and see that she gets justice. Otherwise, I'm going to end up beaten black and blue by her pounding. He felt battered because of her constant pleas, because of her constant badgering, her nagging, trying to get her way in this particular court case. Well, you, you look at the parable, and you look at what Jesus says. Now, we know that the purpose of the parable was to teach his disciples to always pray, to never give up. So what was Jesus' point? Well, Jesus says at the end, verse 6, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? We have a righteous judge who willingly honors persistent prayer. And he looks at this unjust judge and he says, see how he acts. Even though he is unjust, even though he doesn't care about people, he'll eventually give in because of that persistence. Now, we have a heavenly father who is unlike that. He loves us. He wants what's best for us. It's, it's similar to the parable that Jesus told about the father who um, would not give his son a, a stone instead of bread, wouldn't give him a snake instead of fish, because even though heaven, earthly fathers may be evil, they still give good gifts to their children. How much more a loving heavenly father, a good heavenly father, will give, give good gifts to his children? And so he says, even though this unjust judge will eventually give justice, how much more will a loving, righteous judge give justice to his chosen ones? 
But he says he gives them to them because they cry out to him day and night. He says, I tell them, he will see that they get justice and they'll get it quickly. Now that word quickly is, is rather interesting, isn't it? Because here you have God's people, his chosen ones, who are crying out to him day and night. They continually cry out to him. They're like that persistent widow. So how can it be said he gives it quickly? Well, he gives it in his own time, and he gives it at the right time. And because he is going to give it, we can depend on him giving it, then it could be considered quickly. It is certain. It is sure. But isn't it the, the fact that sometimes we don't feel like it's quickly? We, we don't feel like it's coming like it should in the time that it should. God doesn't always work by our time schedule. It, it reminds me of Revelation 6.10, where John, as he's having this revelation from the Lord, and the Lord is showing him how, the, how God is going to overcome evil, he, he sees the saints who have been persecuted, and they're under the altar of God, but they're crying out to God in their distress, how long, sovereign Lord, will you continue? How long before you answer our pleas for justice and our pleas for vindication? And that's the message that Jesus has here. That in our distress, in our difficulties, in our times whenever we're calling out to God in prayer, sometimes he's not answering as quickly as we would like him to. So Jesus says, be persistent. Continue in prayer. Be like that persistent widow who doesn't give up in prayer. You see, it may very well be that what God is looking for in us is whether we are as concerned about it as he, we want him to be. I mean, is this just a fleeting request, one that we don't place a lot of priority, we don't place a lot of value in? And so we give it once or twice, but then we don't give it much more beyond that. God says, I want to see how serious you are about this. I want to see if you'll be persistent in prayer, continually bringing it before the Father, because you can depend on it. He will give you what you need, what you, you, that justice that you're looking for in his due time. But there's a second message that comes through in this parable. It's in this last line, the tagline that he gives to the parable. However, when the Son of Man comes, he says, will he find faith on the earth? You see, in this parable, there are really two in, in the lesson that are seeking something. There are disciples that are seeking answers from God in prayer, seeking his blessing, seeking his provision. But there's also Jesus who is seeking something. He is seeking those who are going to be faithful. He says, will he find faithful folks whenever he comes back? Well, what demonstrates that faithfulness? In the context of the parable, it's that faithfulness and that persistence in prayer. When the Son of Man comes back, he says, will he find faithful prayer practitioners? who are always going to God in prayer? Or are we ones who just go to prayer whenever we have a, 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 a deep need? Or are we instead those who are constantly in prayer? Are we those that do not become discouraged in prayer because it doesn't come in a time whenever we want it to? Will the Son of Man find those who are faithful? Are they faithful in prayer? Well, immediately after this parable, Jesus tells another one. And this one also centers on prayer. Notice how Luke starts it in verse 9. To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Luke again explains the lesson of the parable before he tells it. This is the point that you need to be watching for. But it is a parable that again involves prayer. And it involves prayer between the, among those who he says are righteous uh, in their own eyes, and they look down on everyone else. Notice his parable, verse 10. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. 
But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. The Jews typically spent uh, three designated times in prayer. Nine o'clock in the morning, twelve noon, and then three o'clock in the afternoon. Those those beginning of the watches of the day. And and those who went to the temple felt like they had a special attention given on to their prayers. And so you have these two Jews who are going to the temple in order to pray. The approach of the two could not be more different, could they? You have a Pharisee. And his approach to prayer. It, is, it seems, is more a testimonial to himself, isn't it? He, he seems to be praying about himself, and he's praying more to himself and to anyone else who will listen than he seems to be praying to God. He says, look at me. I thank you that I'm not like these other people out here. All these robbers, evildoers, adulteries, especially like this tax collector. And he even points out how good he is. He talks about fasting twice a week. Now, in, in, in the Jewish law, there was only really one prescribed fast, and that was on the Day of Atonement. But the Pharisees, in their self-righteousness, would fast twice a week to show how good they were. Now, typically, they would fast on Mondays and Thursdays. And the reason for fasting on Mondays and Thursdays was because these were the big market days. And so they would come into town with their faces shallow and pale and their clothes and hair all messed up because they are suffering so much in their fasting. They wanted people to see how good they were. And he says, I, I give a tenth of all I get. Everything I have, it doesn't matter, I give a tenth of it. He gives this testimonial about himself as if to say, God, let me convince you how good I am. And aren't you lucky to have someone like me? Then you have this other, a Pharisee, a sinner. And you've got this comparison between a righteous person's prayer versus a sinner's prayer. And Jesus wants us to know that it is the sinner's prayer that he wants us to participate in because it is the sinner, this tax collector, who gives another testimonial, but it's a testimonial of brokenness. He won't even look up to heaven. He beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Here again, the translation doesn't really do justice to what the tax collector says. He doesn't just say, have mercy on me, a sinner. It really should read, have mercy on me, the sinner. I'm a sinner par excellence. I'm, I'm, I'm the worst of sinners, this tax collector says. He comes before God and he says, I don't even... I don't even deserve to be able to approach you. I can't even lift my face and look up to you because in my brokenness, in my sinfulness, I come before you and just seek for your forgiveness. That's the kind of prayer Jesus says God honors. Jesus' point, that a proper view of ourselves and a proper view of others affects our prayers. When you look at the lessons that Jesus tells in this prayer, one of the things Jesus is saying is that if you're proud, you, you don't need to pray. God doesn't listen to the prayers of the proud. And if you despise others, there's no reason for you to pray. Because God does not honor the prayers of those who are looking down on others, especially while they're praying. True prayer comes from setting our, si our lives not beside others to compare with others but we set our, our lives beside the life of God. And the question is not, am I as good as others or am I better than others? The question is, am I as good as God? And when the answer comes back, no, I humbly look up to God and I say, forgive me because I failed you. That's the kind of prayer practitioners that Jesus said God is looking for. That's the kind of prayer practitioners that disciples are.
They are those that humbly come before God and admit their brokenness, admit their shortcoming as they come to God. James gives a similar message over in James chapter 4 as he talks about prayer practitioners, true prayer practitioners, versus those who strive for self. Go to James chapter 4 and listen to James's words and listen to how similar that the message is to these two parables that we just read. The one that focuses on praying and always praying and never giving up and those who pray out of their own self-righteousness versus those who pray out of their own self-evaluation and humility. James chapter 4, starting in verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. When you do ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives, that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think Scripture says without reason that he jealously longs for the spirit he has caused to dwell in us? That he gives us more grace. That is why Scripture said, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. As you look at the two different types of individuals that James writes about, the self-strivers, both of them are persistent. The self-strivers and prayer practitioners. But self-strivers are persistent, but in the wrong way. They're persistent to get what they can for themselves. And they strive and they scrape and they fight and they quarrel and they struggle every way they can to get what they can by their own power. He said, those are not the type of disciples that Jesus is looking for. Those are not the disciples that God desires. You covet, you cannot get, you quarrel, you fight. You don't have because you're not asking God. You're not talking to him and depending on him. And then he says, even when you do ask, you're doing it with the wrong motives. He talks about that pride, just like the, the, the Pharisee in the parable. The one who comes and, and, and it's all about self. But then he talks about true prayer practitioners, those who are persistent, but they humbly wait as they humbly evaluate themselves. Submit yourselves then to God, he says. At the end of, in verse 10, he says, humble yourselves before the Lord. He will lift you up. And all along, what you're doing is you're drawing near to God so he'll draw near to you. Because, what James says, God opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. He answers the humble. Now, you look at what James says, and you compare that to what Jesus has described in a parable about a persistent widow as she brings her petition to an, a godless judge. You listen to what Jesus says about a righteous man's prayer versus a sinner's prayer. And we go back to the beginning, 1 Thessalonians 5, where Paul says, pray continually. What does it look like to pray without ceasing? Different translations will put it different ways. It's sometimes pray continually, pray constantly, pray always, pray without ceasing, pray at all times. It is this idea to be in this constant mode of prayer. But it's impossible to go through life and to be constantly wording a prayer on our lips, isn't it? So what does it mean? What does it look like for a disciple to live a life of prayer without ceasing? A prayer that is going on continually. How do we do that? 
Well, again, look at the parables. Look at what James says. And what they are talking about, what Jesus desires from his disciples, is a life that is lived in an attitude of prayer. It is lived in the environment of prayer. Now, there are times when we need to have prayer that is directed and focused with God. It may be in a setting like I'm in right now that is closed off from anyone else, and I direct my thoughts and my words and my attitude, my mind, everything, my heart, everything is directed to God during that time. It is a focused prayer time. Jesus did that. Jesus becomes our, our example of this, by the way. His life was one that had this attitude of prayer. He would separate himself from others so he could spend some quality, focused time with his heavenly Father. And that certainly is a part of what God is looking for in persistent prayer. But the words are, do it without ceasing. Have this attitude of prayer without ceasing. I've sometimes asked people in a class, have you come to the point in your life when you, are, you, you never have a waking moment when you are not aware of the presence of God? It, are, have you come to the point in your life where every waking moment of the day, every, every part of the day that you are aware, that you are also constantly aware that God is present with you? See, that's that attitude of constant prayer that, that the disciple needs to have. Constantly understanding that God is there, that he is present, that he is walking with us, he is walking alongside us, that he's leading, that he is watching our back. And so you go through life with a prayer on your heart, in your mind. It is that constant communication with God. It's, it's kind of like having a best friend that is by your side as you're going through your day. Now, do you ignore the best friend? No, of course not. <clears throat> you, you have conversation. You have communion with that friend. You, you uh, go through life and, and you notice something and you point it out to your friend. Or you, you have a thought and you mention it to your friend. Or you have a thanksgiving for something. You're thankful or you're, you're praising God for something and you mention it to your friend. It's that kind of attitude of prayerful existence that God is looking for in disciples. I go along and I say, God, thank you for this beautiful day. That's all you say. But it is an, it, it, it is an acknowledgement of the blessing that God has given you in that moment. You go along and you're reminded of a, a care or a concern that you have and you just quickly say, God, help me out in this, or help my friend in this, or God, I, I just been reminded of someone that's struggling with a health concern or a family concern or something that's going on in their life. Father, please bless them right now, wherever they are. It's not a lengthy prayer. It's maybe just a sentence prayer, maybe not even a sentence, where you just look and say, Lord, help. That's that attitude of constant prayer of going through life and never letting the, the communication, the conversation stop. It is a constant conversation with God. Remember, Paul follows up with rejoice, pray, give thanks in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18, with the words in verse 19, do not quench the spirit. Is there a connection between the two? Certainly there is. Because it is through this constant attitude and practice of prayer, this constant conversation with God that never ends, that the Spirit is working in my life and He is forming me and molding me more to be of what God wants me to be in the image of Jesus Christ, as we talked about last week. But it is that prayer that provides that power and that contact, that connection with what God and what the Spirit is doing in my life. Don't quench the Spirit. I can quench the Spirit by turning my attention away from God, turning my attention away from a conversation with God and giving focus on other things. What James says is being friendship with the world. And so I am constantly in prayer. I'm rejoicing. I'm giving thanks. I'm giving the Spirit uh, access to my life to do His work in my life. There are so many barriers that get in the way, don't they? So many things that try to distract me from that constant conversation, that constant communion with God. And I turn away from those and I stay focused on his, his 
ever present, uh, being beside me, always being there and having that conversation with me. Leon Crouch said in a book on 1 Thessalonians that he wrote, he said, the maintenance of spiritual life depends upon continuing in prayer. Do you believe that? The maintenance of spiritual life depends upon continuing in prayer. You see, I would maintain, based on what Jesus said, based on what James said, it is impossible to be a disciple of Jesus Christ if you are not constant in prayer. To put it another way, if you are not living out this life of persistent prayer, it is impossible for you to keep growing as a disciple. You have cut off your resource of power to be molded in the image of Jesus Christ, which is what the goal of a disciple is to be, to, to be molded by the Spirit, to be formed and become like Jesus, and then to follow Him and following His example. We find that connection through persistent prayer. And so, as you evaluate your own prayer life, are you persistent or periodic? Are you penitent or are you proud? In your prayer life, are you God-seeking or are you self-seeking? How is your communion and your communication with God? Because if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, if you're going to follow him, you're going to have communication with him. You're going to have communion with him, and it's going to be constant. So, as a disciple, how are you as a prayer practitioner? Spend those moments in, in focused prayer, but then live your life in prayer and follow Jesus as a disciple.